My dearly beloved in Christ, there are many lessons we can take from this parable of the wicked servant, but I would like to apply from it the doctrine of purgatory. Notice that the wicked servant who himself had been forgiven because he entreated the master would not have compassion on his fellow servant. But it says he threw him into jail, into prison, until all the debt was paid. Now we know that with our sins, with every sin, there are two aspects. There is the guilt of sin, and there is the honor of God that was damaged or taken away by that sin. And so the sin is forgiven by true contrition, by a good confession. But the honor of God must be restored. It is what we call the temporal punishment due to sin. And this only stands to reason. Can you imagine a criminal going before a judge who has committed terrible crimes against his fellow men? And as these crimes are recited, he begins to weep and lament, I am so sorry. What judge would say, oh, you're sorry? Okay, it's all wiped away. Goodbye, you're, you're dismissed. That's absurd. The debt has to be paid. It's true that at times a judge may reduce the sentence. There is mercy exercised, but common sense tells us that the debt must be paid. But then, in the 15th or 16th century, a heretic came along named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther concocted this absurd idea that all one needs to do is profess faith in our Lord and everything is wiped away because of that faith. Now, that, such an idea had never been heard before. It is not in Scripture, and yet millions of Protestants around the world believe that. And Protestants find it very hard to accept the Catholic dogma of purgatory. One of the arguments they make is, well, the word purgatory doesn't appear in the Bible. But you know, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. The, in, the word incarnation doesn't appear in the Bible. But those are no, nonetheless dogmas just because the word does not appear. Note that when Adam sinned, he was repentant. But he still had to earn his bread in the sweat of his brow. He still had to pay back, so to speak, the debt to Almighty God. When King David fell into adultery, he was deeply repentant. He wrote beautiful psalms, such as Psalm num number 50, the Miserere, of repentance. But still, the child born of this adultery died, and there was rebellion in his own household as a punishment for his sin. He still had to atone for the sin. And that's what we call temporal punishment. So really, purgatory stands to reason. It is a place where souls who are in the grace of God, but still burdened with the temporal punishment due to their sins, have an opportunity to atone, that they might enter heaven. St. John says, nothing defiled shall enter heaven. And that only stands to reason, because God, who is all perfect, all holy, cannot unite himself to a being that is besmirched with sin and the remains of sin. And so really, properly understood, purgatory is a merciful creation of Almighty God, because were there no purgatory... Those that died with venial sins only on their soul would have to be cast into hell because they couldn't go to heaven to be united to God with his all, who is all holy because they had those venial sins, those detestable sins, if we are to look at them from the eyes of God. They had those stains on their souls. Then Protestants will say, well, prove purgatory from Scripture. And there are several very good proofs. One of them is our Lord said that a sin against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven either in this world or in the world to come, indicating that there are sins that are forgiven in the world to come, namely venial sins on the souls of those who die in the grace of God. We also have St. John, I'm sorry, St. Paul 
In his first epistle to Corinthians, the third chapter, he talks about every man's work shall be tried by fire of what sort it may be. And he shall be saved, but by the fire. And, of course, scripture commentators look upon that as a very clear indication of purgatory. But the best proof of all is in the Old Testament, in the second book of Maccabees. And sadly, the Protestants, because they follow Martin Luther, and Luther rejected seven books of the Old Testament, just threw them out even though they had been in the Bible for hundreds, over a thousand years. And among those seven books were the two books of the Maccabees. But in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, it talks about Judas Maccabeus had a collection made and sent it to Jerusalem for sacrifice to be offered for those slain in a battle who had sinned. They had taken booty, they had taken money of their enemies that they were not to have taken. They were told they could not have. And they had taken it and concealed it on their clothing. And for that reason, they were slain in the battle. And it says in the book of the Bible, the Holy Ghost says that Judas did this, sent this money for sacrifices, believing it a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. And of course, that's not the only instance in which we know that the Jews, even before the time of Christ, prayed for the faithful, for their, for the departed. The early Christians prayed for the faithful departed. So purgatory is not some new doctrine that was created by the Council of Trent. It has been solemnly defined both in the Council of Florence and in the Council of Trent, but it has always been a belief of the faithful, that there may be those faithful Catholics who died and are in need of our prayers because they have yet to atone for all of their sins. So the doctrine of purgatory is very important and what can we gain from it? What, what are the benefits from reflecting upon purgatory? First of all, the need to help the souls detained there. There may be souls waiting yearning, desiring our suffrages, our prayers, that they might be purified and enter heaven. Because you see, the souls in purgatory cannot go to Mass, they cannot receive the sacraments, they cannot pray for themselves, all they can do is suffer. And of course the suffering is very great if we are to believe the revelations of the saints. And the greatest suffering of all is that now that they have left this veil of tears, they fully understand as we do not. Our understanding is so shrouded, so uh, weak. They understand how God is everything. And they yearn to be united to God, but they're held back by those remains of their sins that have yet to be atoned. And how much they appreciate our prayers and suffrages. So we can help the souls in purgatory by our masses, our prayers, our communions, our rosaries, our indulgences, our sacrifices, our acts of charity. So many ways that we can help them. And let us remember that one day we may be in their position, dependent on the charity of others. So this is a great act of charity on our part to help the souls in purgatory. But also, by reflecting upon purgatory, reading about it, we will want to do all that we can to avoid purgatory so that we don't have to go there. Because we understand that this life is a time of mercy and the next life is a time of justice when the debts must be paid. Far better to pay them now in time. Not to put off atoning for our past sins. Not to put that off until the next life, when we shall have to do so in purgatory. So let us, my dear friends, let us reflect upon purgatory and be ready to explain to non-Catholics who ask, why do you Catholics believe in purgatory? To be able to explain it to them. And especially to explain it only stands to reason. Use that example I gave you of a judge who has a criminal, let's say a criminal who killed a fellow man. 
And is he going to say, oh, okay, you can walk free just because the person is very repentant? The criminal is very repentant? No, he has to do the time. He has to atone to society by punishment, by imprisonment. And so likewise, we must atone for the temporal punishment due to our sins. Far better to do so now in this life rather than to put it off to the next. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.